So welcome, Jana Hari. We are very honored to have you here in this uh, huge exhibition of the Like Oscar Barnack Award and you're the winner this year. So how do you feel between all the other photographers? I mean, I feel very honored. I honestly think, I'm not sure, I mean, I'm very surprised uh, about the about winning uh, and uh, it's also, it's lovely to see this body of work on the wall and being beautifully printed uh, next to all these amazing names and photographs. So it's a series about women in Afghanistan and um, it's a close connection to your biography. So maybe we can start on this. Um, how did you come to Afghanistan? Uh, for sure. I am Iranian Canadian. I was born in Iran and then went to Canada as a teenager. And after I finished university, um, I moved back to Iran, trying to make it as a photographer. Uh, but it's very difficult. It's, uh, as a journalist, there's a lot of pressure. And um, I was actually supposed to go on assignment in Afghanistan. Six days before that, uh, a group of my friends were arrested. So ironically, in the midst of all the violence in Afghanistan, by the time I reached there, I felt safer. The series is titled Promises Written on the Eyes Left in the Sun. So we can explain. talk on this, explain it maybe. Yes. For sure. Um, 20 years ago, when Americans uh, invaded Afghanistan, in November, Laura Bush uh, went on public radio uh, and put Afghan women in, in the center of war effort, uh, claiming that we invaded Afghanistan to liberate women, to free them. And fast forward 20 years later, when the Americans sat down at negotiation table with the Taliban, they not only sidelined the government, the Afghan government, but they also sidelined the very same women that they, they uh, claim they've invaded Afghanistan for. So there's barely any women at the table. And uh, one thing I say is there is no doubt that foreigners and Americans had to leave Afghanistan at some point, that is for sure. But how they did it, when they did it, it's what it, what's important. And the way they did it, um, many of these women that I have photographed over the years had to flee Afghanistan. Um, uh, they're either in Europe, America, many of them are in limbo in Pakistan and Iran without knowing what future holds. And those who stayed, uh, almost all of them feel that they've been abandoned, they've been left behind. So that is why I call this promises written on the ice and left in the sun. It's actually a Persian proverb. Yeah. We have a lot of uh, images in the series that are not um, showing terror or hate or um, the war, mm -hmm. um, but uh, images of a life that's uh, free mm -hmm. and also the women mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. are able to be free, but it changed completely. It, that was intentional. That yeah. is, the intention behind yeah. that is, this is what we lost. Yeah. Yeah. This existed, this is what we lost. Yeah. And I think it's much more important for somebody who is in the West, is um, yeah. away from Afghanistan. Yeah. Someone would relate to an image like this or this more than a woman in burqa. So it's important to shorten that gap yeah. by showing similar moments that you would feel mm -hmm. or a mother hugging her daughter. Mm -hmm. You would relate to that feeling rather than putting her in burqa and holding her yeah. child yeah. on their yeah. side. We see no burqa. No in burqa, it's intentional. Yeah. And do you feel um, that you are more a documentary photographer or more uh, interested in the stories behind? Um, I like the title visual storyteller because that's what I do. Um, um, we talked with Valentin a lot about this about subjectivity, objectivity. I think, I mean, objectivity doesn't exist. I'm very conscious of um, how I tell this story, how I form this story. This is not the story of all of Afghanistan. This is a story that I want to tell. Very colorful scene. All the women are dressed up, have makeup, and uh, it's a very, uh, it's a scene you won't expect in Afghanistan. So uh, your focus is different. Yes, I mean, I mean, as I'm talking, I'm having goosebumps right now. This was Nauru celebration, the Persian New Year in March. And uh, this was unfortunately the last Nauru's before Taliban took over. And the interesting thing is Afghanistan is so remote that we weren't even sure if this was going to happen. We just heard there is a big celebration in Miramar and we showed up. 
we were told about seven to 8,000 people had traveled from neighboring districts uh, to mm -hmm. come and celebrate. And Daikundi is a region, it's uh, majority Hazaras. They're very open-minded. They also wear very colorful clothes. And I love this thing, because as we were like, many of these women, they walked for hours and hours. They would like dress in uh, dresses that we would wear to a wedding mm -hmm. and makeup, mm -hmm. and they all came for the celebration. Um, it was beautiful. It's also bittersweet, knowing yeah. that this yeah. won't happen for a long time. You photographed it in March last year, so it's completely different this year. Um, and I think it's very important to reflect on this series that it's a time before and a time after. Mm -hmm. So how was your experience during um, the takeover? I was, uh, I was in Kabul when Kabul fell. The night before the fall, uh, we were together with a group of friends and I remember me and Andrew Coulty, Australian photographer, we went to the kitchen and just like by that time I had decided that I'm going to leave by the end of the week, I'm not going to stay. Next morning uh, we booked our tickets in the middle of the night for the following days, not that day, at 4 a.m. I went to the airport uh, to, there were a flood of Afghans trying to leave, and this is still before the fall. So I went to the airport to photograph these Afghans. Then we went um, and I photographed a flight that now I understand it was the last flight that took off. And then um, when we were going back to my apartment, uh, it was me and a few other journalists, the, all of a sudden the city was um, like traffic everywhere. You couldn't even move. So we got out of the car, we went, something was off. Um, and I have a point with this. We bought a bunch of food because we weren't sure what was going on. Went home. Um, then I decided, I heard there were masses of people in front of banks trying to get money. And I went there and it was the first time I heard uh, Taliban is in Kabul. They're marching on the street and we were getting phone calls. They're in company, is there. And, um, and as I was going home, so all of a sudden this traffic disappeared. Uh, the streets were deserted and people, hundreds of them, running in every direction. And I remember, even if I had time to get out and take photo or film, the, f the look on their faces, nothing could have captured that. The, the fear, the um, fear of knowing what was going to happen. And as I was going, uh, I live in a part of uh, the city where there are a lot of beauty salons. And I remember we were driving and I just turned back and men were stripping uh, photos of women off. And by then we knew it was over. Got to my apartment. I was, as I was going upstairs, all my neighbors were like running around crying. Went up, got a phone call that I have 20 minutes to pack and leave. Uh, called my partner, he ran across the city, not ran, he was on a motorbike, came, we, he decided to stay, I left. Um, I packed and I left with a lot of guilt because I am very privileged to have a passport, to have a money and leave thinking that I left everybody behind and thinking that I won't be able to come yeah, back. Yeah. But of course, there are also images uh, that show the grief um, and the terror. And I think um, on this wall, it's very important to see also what happened um, when the Taliban came back. Mm -hmm. So it was important to put these images in the series for you. Absolutely, yes. I mean, these three are from the last months before the fall. And the violence was at a level um, just mind-blowing. There was like attack every day, every day, every day. There were targeted assassination every day, every day. Um, and it is part of the reality, right? It's important to be included in this series. Yeah. But how you do it, which picture you choose to tell that story, that's important. But you're so courage um, to stand this and uh, to go out and make your images. Uh, so how can you stand this all the time? The one thing that I always talk about this openly is like uh, people are like, oh, you're so courageous. It's like sometimes I'm so filled with fear that I'm paralyzed and I can't get out of my bed. It's like it's, it's scary to go and run and shoot this. Um, but we do this because we know it's important because uh, and then once you do it, it's like to me, it's like climbing mountain. Once you reach the peak, you feel good. You're like, I did it. Um, so, and it's important to be afraid because that's your defense mechanism. If you're not fearful, fearful is not the right word. If you're not afraid, if you don't feel the fear, 
it's dangerous. That's when you do stupid things. So that's for that. Uh, why we do this? Because it's so important to cover this. And what's happening now, which is important, is the violence is still going on in Afghanistan. Maybe not as bad as it was in the last year or two. Um, there is still bombing going on. There are still suicide attacks, a lot of attacks on schools. Um, however, Taliban doesn't allow journalists to cover it. And they, they lie about the number of deaths. They try to, um, they, they force uh, hospitals not to announce the numbers, right? Um, and that's dangerous. And that's why journalists, it's important to work and stay and report on these things. And my favorite photo. Yeah. <laughs> Hafiza. Hafiza is a very important portrait in this series. And it's a uh, very, yeah dramatic story behind it. Who is she? Hafiza was a, a woman, a 70 something year old woman that I met for a story we did for National Geographic and she, four of her sons took different paths in life. Uh, one of her sons became a Talib, another joined uh, special forces, another one with the military and another one with anti-Taliban militia. And when we met her, she had this um, little open wound on her throat that we were told doctors believe it's caused by grief. And which is important. So like how much grief or how much pain you can carry that it manifests itself in a physical form, right? And I think in modern medicine, we know uh, like these things can show up as cancer. And um, so when we did the, the story, I mean, I didn't overthink it at that time. I was like, this is great, let's photograph it. Then talking to the team as we're forming the story, uh, somebody says, oh, this is, a, this is like Afghanistan with open wounds that is struggling to hear. And she became the symbol of the country for me. How long do you need for this image? Because it's, it's a strong composition, the three generations, the boy who's looking to his grandmother in a way. Minutes, like not even, yeah, like okay. very short. Afghans yeah. are very impatient. Yeah. Usually when you're, especially my previous camera is very loud, not like Leica. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the moment you shoot, they move like, oh, is it finished? I mm -hmm. said, no, 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 one more maybe. Okay. So, I mean, if you look at the sequence of this, I have to look, but mm -hmm. the frames are very few. And I've learned, I think one thing that Afghanistan has done for me is two things actually. One, I've become very patient. Two, uh, I've become a very fast shooter because you know, I know time is, a, um, I can't take it for granted. War may break out, I may get kicked out. So I walk into a space thinking that I have very few minutes. Mm -hmm. So I have to work very quick. I think one point is how you can come close to the people of the language. I think. Absolutely. It's necessary. Absolutely. I think one of the privileges that I have in Afghanistan is that I speak the language, which allows me to work without having to take somebody with me as a translator, which allows me to understand the nuances in the, in the language, make jokes, break the ice, and make them feel comfortable. Uh, definitely, it's so important to speak the language. Yeah. And maybe also the fact that you were a woman? Definitely, definitely. So I used to argue before the fall, uh, being a woman in Afghanistan it was like a third gender. I had access to everything that men had and I had access to inside homes and women's to photograph that. After the fall, unfortunately, some things have changed with Taliban. There are things that I'm, I can't photograph, that I'm not allowed to enter spaces, but still I think I have more access than men do, uh, which is wonderful. Um, Afghanistan has been home, 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 you know, okay. I would go out for vacation, but that's about it. Um, moving forward, um, personal life has become very difficult yeah. in Afghanistan. So we just gave up our apartment 10 days ago, okay. just before this. Uh, we're going to move home to a new place, okay. but I will be heavily involved with Afghanistan yeah. working because I have projects going yeah. on. But and you stay in Afghanistan? I will stay in Afghanistan, okay. yes. Yeah. So good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for putting this together.